Let us look at some of these steps in a little bit greater detail. So let's look at some of the preliminary steps. So the preliminary steps, one of them is going to be sampling. As we've already said, there's a tremendous amount of data usually available these days for data mining. So for example, uh, if you take a company like Walmart or take uh, Sam's Club or whatever, some of these companies, you'll find that they've got literally millions and millions of rows of retail level data. Because data mining is occurring on operational data and companies are gathering operational data literally every second. So there's a tremendous amount of data available. So the first step is going to be, even for the data mining process, let's sample some amount of this data. We cannot mine the whole data that is available. Let's sample the data. So there are some considerations in sampling. So you may have to sample from the database. And as we will shortly discuss, there is this concept of oversampling of rare events. Okay, We'll discuss this very shortly uh, from the point of view of a concrete example, so that I'm not going to talk about it too much now. The next step is pre-processing and cleaning the data. So you want to identify what is the type of each of the variables, and you're going to have categorical variables, because not all information is numeric. There's a lot of categorical variables uh, that play a role in data mining. So how do you deal with categorical variables. How do you select variables that we are going to use as part of data reduction? And then there's this whole notion of what is called overfitting of a model. Once again, we have a concrete example that's coming up shortly. How many variables do we want to use? How much data do we want to use? What do you do with missing values? Right? Many times you've got lots of rows of data, but some of the rows have some of the attributes which are missing. What do you do about that? And then finally, you also have the concept of normalizing the data. All of this we'll be talking about pretty soon. And finally, creating partitions, which of course we already know. There could be two partitions, training and validation most often for predictive analytics. But as we've already said, when for a particular problem, you're thinking of using multiple techniques and selecting the best one, then you may also need a third partition called the test partition. Okay, so why do you want to sample? As I've already pointed out, it's because you have huge data sets. And if you try to perform data mining on massive data sets with millions and millions of rows, then you're not going to get a very much better improved model, but it's going to take a lot of time and effort. Okay, and you also want to sample because you want to validate the model. Okay, so rare events, which we've already said, considering oversampling, which we'll talk about shortly. Okay, so let's take an example here for oversampling. So let's say you want to classify a set of people in a population as potential customers or not. Okay, so this can, uh, this can simply be looked at as the same old uh, uh, sports car example, right? You've got a bunch of people, and you want to see who of them are most likely to buy. So that is the classification problem. Now, offhand, if I asked you, would you be happy with a 1% rate of misclassification for this task? In other words, only 1% of your model's predictions are going to be wrong. Would that be okay? Now, off the bat, it looks like 1% is a really good performance for a model. 1% misclassification, in other words, if the model makes 100 predictions, only one of them is going to be wrong. That looks like a fantastic performance. But let's wait a little bit before we pass our judgment. Now consider this. Let's say we're talking about direct mail campaign for a luxury sedan or a sedan or uh, a sports car, as we talked about. Now the very nature of this situation is such that 99% of the population are not potential customers. Only 1% of the population are going to be potential customers for this particular problem, right? So your success cases are only 1% of the total population. So given that that is the case, can we think of an easy way to obtain a, a very simple model that we can just throw out off the bat and the model does the job with only a 1% misclassification rate for this particular problem? Model, by model, we don't have to think of anything fancy. Just tell me how, what kind of a off-the-hand technique can you think of 
to predict whether someone is going to be a buyer or non-buyer and you make only 1% mistakes. Think about it a little, little bit. Now, given the nature of this problem, given that only 1% are actually potential customers, suppose I say, I'm going to take every person and classify them as potential non-customers. Right? In other words, I'm going to say 100% of the people, you show me any person, I'm going to say my prediction for them is going to be they're not going to be a customer. That's my model. My model is to classify everybody as a non-customer. So what is the error rate for the model? For this model, the error rate is only 1% because 99% of the people are non-customers. So when I predict everybody is a non-customer, I'm going to be right 99% of the time. So this model, this trivial, stupid model has only a 1% misclassification, right? So 1% misclassification doesn't seem to be as good as it originally appeared. So this is a no-brainer, this kind of a solution we predicted, but of course, it has to go straight in the garbage can because it's a useless solution, okay? So we want to think about sampling strategy here. So in this case, let us say we've got a population in the same example of a luxury sedan or a sedan or a sports car. Let's say we've got historical information on 50,000 customers, 50,000 customers. Now, if only 1% of them are actually luxury car owners and 99% are not, okay, then out of these 50,000 people, there are only 500 people who are actually owners, only 1%. Remaining 49,500 people are not owners, okay? So this is a rare event in this particular case. The, the rare event is the event of somebody being a customer, or somebody being an owner. That's a rare event, and we've got very few cases available of these rare events. Now, suppose we did our sampling from out of these 50,000, suppose we randomly picked 10,000, okay, then what we are going to get is only 100 people of the 10,000 who are actually owners. Now remember, when we try to build a model, we are trying to build a model that understands the characteristics of people who are going to be buyers. It's trying to learn what are the characteristics that make somebody a buyer, right? So you obviously want to provide the model with lots of examples of people who are buyers so that it can learn. The model has enough data to learn. If out of 10,000, you've got only uh, 100 actual people who are buyers, then the model has very few cases on based on which it can learn about people who are actually going to be buyers, right? So if we did a regular random sample of 10,000, then we would have too few cases. So in these cases, what we might want to do is to oversample the success cases, right? Rather than say, I'm going to take a purely random sample of 10,000 people, I may say my total sample is going to be 10,000, but out of 10,000, I want to have 500 people who are actually owners. So this is not a random sample because if you picked a random sample out of 10,000, only 100 will be actual owners. Okay, but we want to say, no, I want to oversample the owners because I want to give my model enough data to learn the underlying patterns. So we may say, I'm going to have 500 owners and uh, 9,500 non-owners. So I break the original data into owners and non-owners. I take all the owners or sample, let's say, from the 500 or take all of them. And that is called oversampling of the success cases, right? So your sampling strategy has to depend upon how rare is this event? If the event is not so rare, you don't have to worry about it. You can just take a regular random sample and things will work out, okay? And as I discussed earlier, we also have to think about what is the cost of misclassifying a respondent, right? That is, what is the cost of misclassifying a buyer as a non-buyer and a non-buyer as a buyer? These costs may not always be the same, okay? So in this case, that is also going to play a role in uh, how you select your sample, right? That's what we are talking about here. 
the cost of misclassifying a non-respondent and a respondent that may be asymmetrical and that therefore plays a role in how you're going to sample. Okay, so that's another uh, that's another important point about sampling strategy. Now we want to look at another important aspect about the data types and especially how do you deal with qualitative or categorical data. Remember, in data mining, often you're talking about using quantitative techniques. Many of the techniques that we are going to study will require all the variables to be numerical. For example, multiple regression, everything has to be a number. Okay, it requires all the variables to be numerical, but we already know not all the variables are numerical. There are quantitative variables on the right hand side, but there are also qualitative or categorical variables on the left hand side, and quite a lot of information in data mining is actually categorical. Well, then what do you do when you have to use these categorical variables in quantitative techniques? That's what we're going to talk about now, right? So we've got uh, categorical variables could be ordered or unordered, which is from the previous side. Ordered is ordinal, unordered is nominal, right? So a categorical variable could be ordered or unordered. If it's ordered and if it's numeric, for example, something has been rated on a five point scale, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, it doesn't mean that two is twice as good as one or that four is twice as good as two. It's just ordered. Two is better than one, three is better than two, four is better than three, five is better than four. It's just an ordering, but the gap between these things is not determined. It's not really accurate, meaning the distance between one and two may not always be the same as the distance between two and three. Okay, so it's just ordered, but many times when you've got an ordered categorical variable, which is numerical, one, two, three, four, five, then in quantitative techniques, you might be able to use the variable as it is. It is possible. You might use it just as it is, or alternately, if you have a good idea of what is the relative magnitudes of one, two, three, four, five, instead of making them one, two, three, four, five, you may say it's one, three, five, seven, nine. And then it's still categorical, but it's a number and you might be able to use it as it is in any technique that requires you to have numerical values, right? So when there's an ordering, there is a, an easy kind of a solution that might work. Of course, you have to think about whether the solution really works or not, how should the numbers be and so on. There might be some thinking that you have to do before you start using those numbers, but it's possible. If there's an ordering, then there's an easier solution. But if it's unordered, meaning if the categories are not at all orderable, there's no real ordering between the categories. For example, let's say we have a data set of people and one of the fields is called status. And each person is either a student or an employed or employed or retired. Let's say those are the only possible values and they're all mutually exclusive. Let's say for the for this purpose, right? So here there's no real ordering of people in, in any sense. This is just purely nominal categories. Well, what do you do with this when you're going to use this in a numerical technique? Okay, how do you convert this into a numerical variable? You do that by creating what are called as dummy variables. We'll shortly see what these are. But when you've got unordered categorical variables, which is nominal, completely nominal with no specific ordering, then if your technique requires you to use, convert that into a number in some way, you can do that by using dummy variables. Now remember, I'm not saying that unordered categorical variables always have to be converted into dummy variables. No, there are several techniques that work with those variables remaining as categories. There's no need to convert them to numbers. Here we are only talking about if your technique requires them to be numbers, how do you deal with them? You deal with it by creating what are called as dummy variables. Let's take an example. So here we are taking a look at the same example that we looked at earlier. We've got a lot of information about people age, status, height, and income. And let's say we are trying to build a model to predict the income, and the technique that we are using requires everything to be numbers. Age is a number, height is a number, great, no problem. How about status? Status is clearly not a number. We know that the status can be student, unemployed, 
retired, employed. Those are the four possible values. Okay, and there's no ordering, so you can't really convert these into numbers directly. So how do you deal with this? Well, the way to deal with this is uh, your uh, is as shown here. So what we are going to do is to convert this as shown here. Notice what has happened here. What has happened here is that earlier status was one column. Now what we have done is we have taken all the distinct possible values of status and made each into a separate column. So status can be student, unemployed, employed or retired. And we made a column for three of them, student, unemployed, employed, right? And for every row, for example, the, the person on the first row, age 23, is a student. So therefore, we put one under student and zero under unemployed and employed. Okay, that is what tells you the person is a student, one being uh, one value for the student attribute. So the second person is also a student, so it's a one. The third person is unemployed. So notice that the third person, which is age 36, unemployed is one. Employed is zero, student is zero. The next person is again a student, age 31, student, so student is one, and so on. Okay, so this is how we convert your categorical variables, purely categorical variables, into dummy variables. The dummy variables here are student, unemployed, and employed. Those are the dummy variables. Okay, notice that uh, the different values of the categorical variable have now become columns. They have now become attributes, and each of those attributes has a 0, 1 value. Okay, of course, it's important to think about why only three. There are four possible values of status, student, unemployed, employed, retired, but we have shown only three here. That is because if you know the value of these three, then the fourth is automatically determined, right? Because every person has a status. So if three of those values are, if you know that the three of them are zero, then the fourth one has to be a one, which is what is happening in this particular case. The person is not a student, not employed, not unemployed, not employed, and therefore the person is retired. So the value of the fourth category is automatically determined based on whether we have zeros or ones for the remaining three. You don't want to have a redundant column because that will cause a lot of problems in your models. Models that deal with quantitative techniques, uh, quantitative values, they run into problems when you've got redundancy in the model. Okay, so that is why we don't want to have this. Another reason also is that uh, the more columns you have, uh, the more complicated your model becomes. And therefore, you, want to, you don't want to have a column that doesn't add any information. Okay, so that's what we really do with respect to dummy variables. Okay, your turn. So here, uh, I've taken a data set which looks very similar, except that instead of the status, I've replaced it with a gender. So gender is your categorical variable. Obviously, there's no ordering between male and female. So here, how would you convert gender into a categorical, into the dummy variables. Think about it once again. Draw your table with the appropriate columns, just like we had done earlier. In the earlier case, our solution showed all these columns, right? So this was the original table. You arrived at this. I want you to do the same thing for this. Show me a complete table, not show me, but you arrive at a complete table, and then we'll take a look at the answer. So pause the video. Think about it carefully, arrive at your solution, and then proceed. Okay, so the problem is to create dummy variable for gender or dummy variable or variables. Okay, as before, what we can see is that when you create dummy variables, what you're going to do is to take a look at all the possible values for the categorical variable. In this case, the categorical variable is gender. And the two, it has only two possible values, F and M. Okay. And as we saw from the previous example, we choose N minus one of those, any N minus one of those. It doesn't matter which one you choose, which, uh, which one you leave out. Leave out any one of them. In the previous case, we had chosen to leave out retired. 
we could have left out any of the others as well. So in this case, let's say we choose to leave out male and therefore our table, resulting table is going to look like this, age. And then we'll have a categorical variable called female, height, income. Okay. And wherever F, the person is a female, the variable F will have a value of one. Where the person is a male, the variable F will have a value of zero. You can verify that. I hope I did it right. You can verify that that's what I've done. Okay, so now the all the variables here are all numerical variables and they can be used in any technique where everything has to be a number. Now clearly we didn't have to have f and m because once f is either a 0 or, the, or 1, the other is automatically determined. So the adding that as another column would be redundant. So we leave it out, which explains why you need to have only n minus 1. In this case, n was 2. So n minus 1 is 1. So we have only one of them. Another important consideration is how many rows of data do we need at a minimum? Remember, if you try to do data mining with too few rows, you might build a model, but the model won't be reliable. After all, if the model is based on just very few examples, then it may not generalize to real life data. The model obviously has to be generalizable because you're going to use it in future for other cases. But if it, if it was built based on too few cases, then it may not be generalizable. So that's an important consideration. So how many data items, or how many rows of data do we need? Well, that depends on several criteria. So for example, in this example, let's say I've got a data set that has two columns. I've just called them X and Y. And let's say that X is your uh, target variable. You're trying to predict X based on y. So y is your predictor variable, x is your target variable, let's say. As opposed to this, you could have a situation where you've got a target variable x and you've got seven different predictor variables. So would the same number of rows suffice in both cases? Doesn't seem to be so, right? Intuitively, we know that in the second case, the model has to learn a lot more about the underlying patterns because there are so many predictor variables. There are so many different combinations of these predictor variables that could be affecting the target variable. So obviously, there's a lot more information needed in the second case than in the first case, right? Because of this, there are so many predictor variables and they can interact in various ways. So you need lots of examples to learn the underlying patterns in the second case. That is something we can understand intuitively, but uh, the field of data mining also gives us certain rules of thumb. So for example, if you have a numerical predictor variable, right? if you've got a numerical uh, target variable and you've got lots of predictor variables, then the rule of thumb says you need at least 10 records for every predictor variable when you're trying to predict a numerical target variable. Okay. So again, going back, in the first example, you've got one predictor variable, one target variable. You need 10 rows per predictor variables. So actually, in this case, 10 rows would suffice. In the second example, which is the table on the right, you've got seven predictor variables. If x was a numerical target variable, then you're going to require at least 70 rows of data, 10 per predictor variable. Okay, so that covers our first example, first case, which is if you're trying to predict a numerical variable, then you need at least 10 records per predictor variable. The second case covers when you got, when you're trying to predict a categorical variable. In other words, when you're trying to classify. In this case, the rule of thumb says you need at least six times m times p records, where m is the number of possible outcome classes. In the examples of classification we have looked at so far, we have had only two classes, which is buyer, non-buyer, owner, non-owner, fraudulent, not fraudulent, spam, not spam. So all of these cases were classifications where there were only two categories, but it's possible that you may have more categories or more classes. Okay, so that is the number M. 
So in all the previous cases, M would have been 2. But it's possible that M could be something else. Okay. And uh, P is the number of predictor variables. Okay. So 6 times M times P, that's the number of records we need. So once again, let's go back here. In the first example, suppose X were a categorical variable and it had, let's say, three categories, three classes, right? So how many records would we need for predicting X? So it says six times M times P, right? Six times three, which is the number of classes times number of predictor variables, which is one. So you would need 18 rows in this case. So the 15 that are shown on the screen would not suffice. In the second case, which is the table on the right, let's say again x is a categorical variable. It has three different values. So you need 6 times 3, 18 times the number of predictor variables, which is 7. Right? So you need 7 times 18, that many rows, which is 70 plus 56, 126 rows we would need for this at least. Of course, if you have more, no problem. It doesn't say that you have to use exactly that many or you know, you can use more, more the merrier always, but you need at least that much. Otherwise, your uh, results will not be valid. So that's a useful rule of thumb to, to go by. So once again, your turn. In this example, what we're saying is if the target variable X is numeric, at least how many rows do we need? We've already talked about this. And if the target variable is categorical with five categories, how many rows do we need? So once again, I would encourage you to stop the video at this point. Probably go back. You know, you've got your slides. You can look at the slides and uh, look at the concepts. Don't look at the answer because the answers are available in your slides, but don't look at them. Uh, so I would suggest that you take a look at this. Arrive at your own answers before proceeding because we're going to discuss these answers anyway. Okay. So clearly the answer for the first one is 10 because there's, it's a numeric and you need 10 times the number of predictive variables. Predictive number of predictive variables is one. So 10 is the answer. And if the target variable is categorical, five categories, at least how many rows do we need? Six times five, 30. Okay. Times the number of predictive variables, one. So the answer is going to be 30. So this was easy. Let's take a look at this once again. So if the target variable is numeric, at least how many rows do we need? If the target variable is categorical with five categories, at least how many rows do we need? Once again, stop, get your answer before proceedings, pause the video and then continue. So here again, let's look at the answers. If it's numeric, well, it says 10 times P, there are seven predictor variables. So it's 10 times seven, you're going to need at least 70 rows. If it's categorical with five categories, at least how many rows? Well, it is six times M times P. So it's going to be six times five times seven. So you would need 210 rows at least. Okay, so that just gives you an idea of how to apply the rule of thumb to see if you have enough data. But of course, as I've already pointed out, when you're doing a data mining exercise, paucity of data is not going to be your issue. So that's not seriously a problem, but uh, nevertheless, if you're doing other kinds of statistical analysis, it's better to uh, remember this rule.